Alright guys, Dominic here for Kit Guru, and today we are reviewing no less than three RTX 5080 partner cards. Now, I know what you're thinking, somehow I've ended up with half of the UK supply and it's going to be absolutely ages before anyone will actually be able to buy these cards. But I figure, considering I've already got them, it makes sense to still review them because eventually we remain hopeful that stock will increase, so we want to have the data out there when cards are actually available to buy. So I spent the last week testing all three cards, and today we're going to find out exactly how they perform. To cut right to the chase then, the three cards I have in question in purely alphabetical order are the Gigabyte Gaming OC, the MSI Supreme SOC, alongside the Palette Gaming Pro OC. Now all three have varying levels of price increases over the £979 baseline MSRP, but I'm going to save all my talking about pricing for the end of the video. Instead, we're first going to take a tour of the cards, looking at the designs, the coolers, the PCBs, and so on, before we move on to look at things like thermal performance, gaming benchmarks, and more. Going purely on alphabetical order then, we're starting off with the Gigabyte Gaming OC. While not fully identical to the Gaming OC designs of the RTX 40 series, such as the 4080 Super, the overall aesthetic is very, very similar. That means we find a matte black plastic shroud, though Gigabyte does make a point of emphasizing that this is textured plastic, which just adds some visual interest. The three fans, which make up part of the Windforce cooling solution, are named Hawk fans, and they measure approximately 110 millimeters in diameter. In terms of its size, the Gaming OC measures in at 340 by 140 by 70 millimeters, while it weighed in at 1,792 grams on my scales. To help support the weight, Gigabyte also includes a little stand which screws into the end of the card to avoid any unwanted sagging. As for the backplate, this is made of a grey metal, and while it is full length, there is a very sizable flow-through area to help with heat dissipation. It's interesting that the backplate wraps over the side slightly as well, and Gigabyte claims this does improve overall structural rigidity. In any case, I think it looks pretty cool. You also notice the BIOS switch positioned on the back, offering a choice of either the silent or performance modes depending on your preference, and the only difference is the fan speed. RGB lighting is an interesting one though, as there's actually a sliding cover, so you can either have the RGB lighting shining through the Gigabyte logo, or you can opt to see the LED strip itself. There's also RGB LEDs positioned on the outer edges of the fans, and this is all controllable within the Gigabyte Control Center software. As expected, power is delivered by a single 12V 2x6 connector, and display outputs consist of three DisplayPort 2.1 and one HDMI 2.1. Moving on to the PCB though, Gigabyte has opted for a 14-phase VRM for the GPU and a 3-phase VRM for the memory, all using monolithic power systems MPS MP87993 MOSFETs rated at 50 amps. A monolithic MP29816 controller is used for the GPU, with a monolithic MP2988 controller used for the memory. As for the heatsink, Gigabyte is using a vapor chamber to contact the GPU die, VRAM, and MOSFETs. The heatsink itself utilizes a total of 9 heat pipes and a dense fin stack. You'll also notice that Gigabyte is not using thermal pads here, but something they call server-grade thermal conductive gel, aka thermal putty. Now, apparently this is meant to reduce failure rates over traditional thermal pads, which is quite hard for me to test one way or another, but it is worth pointing out Gigabyte does recommend to wipe off any excess and reapply the thermal putty if you take the card apart. The next graphics card to look at is the MSI Supreme SoC. Visually, this card is identical to the RTX 5090 Supreme SoC that we reviewed last week, and that means we have the same angular, almost blocky aesthetic, with the shroud comprised of a combination of rigid plastic and some brushed metal sections. It is certainly a good looking card, and it is very well built too. MSI is still using what it calls the Hyperfrozer thermal design, and that includes three Stormforce fans, each of which measuring 100mm in diameter. Dimensions are identical to the 5090 version 2, meaning this is a huge graphics card coming in at 359 by 150 by 76 millimeters. The 5080 is a touch lighter though at 2,661 grams, though that is still very heavy, so we get the same included GPU support stand in the box. As for the backplate, MSI has opted for a single piece of metal that extends about three quarters the length of the card, and the rest is left open to act as a flow through area, so air can pass directly through the heatsink. You can also spot the dual BIOS switch with a choice of the gaming or silent modes. Both share the same clock speed and power draw, the only difference is the fan curve. 
Next up, we can take a look at the RGB lighting with the Supreme logos on the front side, along with the LED strips either side of the central fan acting as the RGB zones. And of course, MSI center is used to control the lighting. As with any 5080, power is delivered by a single 12 volt 2x6 connector. And again, we find the same three DisplayPort 2.1 and one HDMI 2.1 video outputs. As for the PCB though, here MSI has opted for a beefy 16 phase VRM for the GPU and a three phase memory solution. It's no surprise to see more MPS MP87993 MOSFETs used across the board. And just like the other cars on test today, the monolithic MP29816 controller is used for the GPU with an MP29888 controller for the memory. The heatsink is also the same as the RTX 5090 model, and that means no less than 11 heat pipes used throughout the fin stack, while the GPU and memory contacts with the vapor chamber. Smaller, separate base plates are used to contact with the MOSFETs. The final card in our list today is the Palette RTX 5080 Gaming Pro OC, and I would say it's probably the least exciting to look at of the three cards today. It's just pretty plain black all over, but with some glossy sections here, which adds some reflectivity. It's not necessarily ugly, but I'd say it's definitely behind the Supreme and the Gaming OC in terms of my personal preferences. It does still offer three fans as part of the cooling solution though, with each measuring 100 millimeters in diameter. In terms of its size, it is also the smallest card on test today, measuring 331.9 by 127.1 by 60 millimeters. It also weighs in at 1,582 grams on my scales. As for the backplate, this is another full length metal design, but almost half of it has been cut out to act as the flow through area, though it's not completely open as Palette has opted for a vented approach. Next up, we can see the RGB lighting in action. It's relatively low key, but you can actually connect an ARGB cable to the card and control the lighting via your motherboard if that is your preference. As expected, power is again delivered by a single 12 volt 2x6 connector, and we also find three DisplayPort 2.1 and one HDMI 2.1. As for Palette's PCB then, the design here is very similar to the Gigabyte Gaming OC, given we find a 14 phase GPU VRM and a 3 phase memory VRM, all using 50 amp MPS MP87993 MOSFETs. Once more, a monolithic MP29816 controller is used for the GPU, and a monolithic MP29888 controller is used for the memory. Palette is also jumped on the vapor chamber bandwagon, and this contacts with the GPU and memory, though the MOSFETs are cooled by separate base plates. The Finstack itself utilizes a total of eight heat pipes. That is gonna do it though for our look at the three cards on test today, and it's now time to move on to our testing. Here we are using our brand new GPU test system for 2025, and this is powered by MSI. This machine is packing in AMD's Ryzen 7 9800X 3D processor, paired with the MSI MPG X870E carbon Wi-Fi motherboard, and we've got 64 gigs of Kingston Fury Beast DDR5 6000 CL30. All testing was also done using the MSI MPG 321 URX QD OLED monitor. Starting out then with out of the box thermal performance. Here I've tested both BIOS modes for all three cards and honestly, I think the results are as expected. That means the MSI Supreme SoC does offer the lowest raw thermals, but honestly, I was hoping to see that given it's using the same cooler from the RTX 5090 model and it is physically massive. The gaming OC using the performance BIOS sits in third place while it's silent BIOS and then both modes of the Palette Gaming Pro OC all hover around the 65 degree mark for GPU temperatures, but with VRAM in the 70s for the palette card. Before moving on from thermals, however, I do just want to do one extra area of testing, and that's with the Gigabyte Gaming OC. As mentioned, Gigabyte recommends to clean off and reapply the thermal putty if you do take the card apart. Now, I don't actually have any thermal putty to hand here. Gigabyte said they'd do it for me when I send the card back, but I thought, what happens if we don't reapply the thermal putty and just put the card back together? So that's exactly what I did. And then I reround thermal performance where we're focusing on the VRAM temperatures as obviously this is what the thermal putty is contacting with. So looking at VRAM thermals over our 30 minute stress test, there is only a very small difference observed. At stock, for instance, the temperatures stayed around 62 degrees most of the time, but now things are oscillating up to 64 degrees more often, but it's really not a significant change. It is of course very hard to say if there might be a more significant long-term impact, especially to something like the VRM thermals, so I would still definitely take Gigabyte's advice and reapply the thermal putty if it were my card. 
There is more good use for all three cards, however, when coming onto our noise levels, as they are all fairly quiet. Now, the Gaming Pro OC using its performance BIOS does actually run slightly louder than the NVIDIA Founds Edition, while its silent BIOS is only one decibel quieter. As it turns out, the former runs the fan speeds at 42%, while the latter mode only drops that to 39%, so there's really not that much of a difference. The MSI Supreme SoC is the quietest card tested, however, when using its silent BIOS, and that saw the fan speed hit just 1100 RPM. That said, the Gigabyte Gaming OC really isn't much louder at all, with its three fans spinning up to 1280 RPM. To really get an idea of the efficiency of each cooler though, here we retest with noise output normalized to 40 decibels. At the top we have the Nvidia Founders Edition running the hottest, though the Gaming Pro OC isn't a huge improvement, barely dropping GPU temperature, though VRAM thermals do improve by 4 degrees. Next up is the Gaming OC with the GPU and VRAM at 59.7 degrees and 62 degrees respectively, but there is a clear gulf between both of those cards and the MSI Supreme SoC. Again, I would expect that to form that one the best considering it is the biggest and heaviest, but it's still good to see. As for our game benchmarks then, we really don't focus too heavily on these in our partner card reviews as performance doesn't tend to change a whole lot when compared to the reference models. In this instance, all three RTX 5080s we are reviewing today perform functionally identically given there's typically less than a single frame separating all three, so there's just no way you'd actually spot the difference between the cards when gaming in the real world. The reason for such similar gaming performance is because all three cards clock at basically the same frequency. Here you can see the performance or gaming BIOS modes of each card and the frequency plots overlap each other for basically the entirety of the 30 minute stress test. In fact, average over the duration of the stress test, just 7 MHz separates the Palette, MSI and Gigabyte models. I also tested out the silent BIOS modes with only the Palette coming in noticeably slower than the rest, but still ahead of the Founders Edition. Interestingly though, we do actually observe some difference in power draw. The Gaming Pro OC drew just under 370 watts in our testing, ahead of the Gaming OC on 366 watts, while the Supreme was even more efficient at just 350 watts, and I'm wondering if that's due to its beefier VRM. That lower power draw does mean the Supreme is top dog when it comes to performance per watt, but the differences are honestly very small between all three cars on test today, and I personally wouldn't factor that into a buying decision. The last area to look at in this video then is going to be manual overclocking and as it turns out I was able to push the memory sliders up to the maximum on all three cards so the only other two variables were how far we could push the GPU clock and the power limit sliders. The Gigabyte Gaming OC actually allows for the biggest adjustment to the power limit with the slider going up to 125% which is a 450 watt maximum and we added 355 megahertz to the GPU. The Supreme SoC also allows for some power adjustment, but only up to 111%, and we added 400MHz to the GPU. Lastly, the Gaming Pro OC has the smallest power limit adjustment of just up to 105%, and we were able to add 295MHz to the GPU core. Now, I have to say all three overclocks were pretty impressive. All three models ran at over 3150MHz, resulting in gains of between 7-10% to over the stock results. That means if I were to buy a 5080 myself, I would definitely overclock it, but in terms of which of the three cards overclocked the best, there's really very little to split between them. The Gaming OC was a frame ahead on a couple of occasions, but really nothing significant. The Gaming OC did see the biggest increase to power draw though, hitting 410.5 watts, which is actually a 20 watt increase over the Gaming Pro OC, which was just under 390 watts, while the Supreme SoC was still the most frugal, drawing just under 382 watts. That brings us then onto the end of this RTX 5080 roundup, and honestly, I think all three cards are very solid in their own right, though obviously there were some performance trends that became clear over our testing. Now, of the three cards, Palette's Gaming Pro OC may be the least interesting from a visual perspective, but that's just my personal opinion, and you could prefer something a bit less flashy like this. It also has the benefit of being the smallest of the three cards tested, while still producing solid thermal results, though it did run the hottest in our noise normalized test, barely beating the NVIDIA Founders Edition. The Gigabyte Gaming OC model strikes arguably a better balance of aesthetics and performance given it is a larger cooler but it does pack in more RGB lighting and arguably a more stylish backplate. Its heft also means it delivers significantly more eye-catching thermal results, this time dropping VRAM temperatures by 10 degrees over the Founders Edition in our noise normalized test. 
It's of course the MSI Supreme SoC that is hands down the best from a thermal perspective though, given it ran almost 8 degrees cooler than the gaming OC when noise normalised. It is comfortably the biggest card on test today however, and actually appears to use the same cooler as the RTX 5090 Supreme SoC, so it will take up 4 slots in your system and it weighs over 2.5 kilograms. Pricing, however, is another very important angle to consider, where I think the more premium models on test really do flatter to deceive. After all, the MSRP is meant to be £979, yet the Supreme SoC is listed for pre-order at nearly £1,400, while the Gaming OC is up for £1,250. That means the MSI Supreme SoC is a staggering 41% premium over the baseline MSRP, while the gaming OC is slightly more palatable but still very expensive with a 28% premium. Because of that, I actually think it's the Palette Gaming Pro OC that I would recommend first. Yet, yeah, it's not the flashiest or the best looking card on test today and it didn't produce the best thermal performance, but at £1,115 it's just a 14% premium over the MSRP. In fact, if you get the non-OC model, the difference is just 8%, which really is a lot more like it. Clearly then, pricing is a real and highly significant issue for the RTX 5080 right now. After all, this GPU only really makes sense if it's at the same price as the outgoing RTX 4080 Super, considering the performance gains over that last-gen GPU are underwhelming at best. In fact, considering that the RTX 4090 is still always the faster GPU, I actually think some of these prices are at a point where it would make a lot more sense to actually pick up a used version of the previous generation flagship than it would to go out and buy a brand new RTX 5080. And that is a very disappointing place to be for this new GPU. And is something I really hope will be rectified as stock levels do improve and hopefully pricing drops to more sensible levels. Anyway guys, that is where I'm going to leave this video. If you liked it, please do toss me a thumbs up. And as always, let me know your thoughts down in the comments below. Please do subscribe if you haven't already and be sure to dig that notification bell so you don't miss when we upload a new video. If you want to carry on the conversation, you can find a link to our Discord server down in the description. And while you're there, you can help us out by picking up some of our merch, such as one of the t-shirts you can see on screen now. Finally, if you want to help us out further, you can even consider backing us on Patreon. That's it for this one though, guys. I'm Dominic for Kick Guru, and I'll see you in the next video.